guys for being here. Um, I'm with Anon, who's the CEO of Maker. Uh, you saw a little tease that was there. Um, Anon, so we are, we are launching a channel, as you saw, called Smartish with Maker. And there's a lot of people who are in business with Maker, and I can't tell you how many times I have conversations with Ma about Maker that people say, I've heard of Maker, but, but what is it? And there's probably some people in this room that are still probably asking that same question. So, so explain to them what Maker is. Maker, Maker is the world's largest player in short form online video content and, and the largest network on YouTube. We do three things. We inspire expression and empower creators to maximize the reach and monetization. We entertain global audiences with authentic online content that we curate and organize around core passions and interests. And we enable global brands to reach and engage millennials at very large scale. So let's talk about, let's talk about the number of makers. Like how many people are making content every day for Maker? So we, we have a network, a global network of uh, more than 55,000 channels, 55,000 creators in more than 100 countries around the world. Uh, there are 650 million subscriptions to channels in our network. And what's also interesting is that every single day, we get between 10 to 15,000 new creators that are looking to join us, of which we pick between 100 and 150. This is every single day. Uh, so while- So everyone, no, but, so everyone can't just be a maker. It is, it, you, you are very selective. That's right. So yeah. while the numbers are very big, because you operate online and on the web, so numbers are very big. Uh, you know, we generate today north of 10 billion monthly views. This is more than a billion views a day. Uh, so while the numbers are very big, we still are very focused on quality. And we do that by selecting and picking the right creators that we onboard our network. That's incredible, 10 billion, that's with a B, views a month. Correct, yeah. yeah. And how has that scaled? Like how has the growth, explain to everyone how the growth of Maker has happened over the last couple of years. Uh, the growth has been tremendous, I mean only you know, about two years ago, it was in the hundreds of millions, and today we're in, you know, north of 10 billion. Uh, you know, Disney, as you may know, bought the company, and what's interesting is when we started the conversation with Disney, we were at around 4 billion monthly views. By the time we closed the deal at five and a half, and now we're north of 10 a year later. So even, you know, of a very large base, we still continue to grow and expand, and it's just amazing to see how it's a tidal wave that affects the whole industry, and we're riding and continue to grow even on that wave. So from your projections, how, will, how many views will Maker have monthly views a year from now, a year and a half from now? You know, it's, uh, it, we, we don't make projections, but the scale is clearly very large, and it continues to grow. And I should say that most of our viewership today doesn't, hardly includes Disney content. This is all Maker organic with a little bit of Disney uh, with it, but once we expect to activate Disney content, the numbers should, you know, continue to grow at a very rapid pace. Um, I want to talk about the people who create content. You guys saw Snoop Dogg in the video. You saw that, you know, they're creating content with myself, people like James Franco. But th what I find to be interesting about Maker is there is an army of people that are creating content for Maker that most of the people in this room, or some of the people in this room, probably have never heard of. Right. Um, a lot of people you know, on the planet haven't heard of, but the millennial audience know very, very well. Um, PewDiePie being one of those people. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's a really amazing phenomenon. The YouTube creators are mega stars. And you know, some people in the audience may not know them, but kids and the millennials know them extremely well. Yeah. And when, when some of the stars walk in the street, they can't, they'll be mobbed. They, they cannot just walk freely, just like you know, rock stars or movie stars. Yeah. Uh, the Variety recently published a, a research that said that of the, uh, within teenagers in America, the top five most influential personalities are all YouTubers and seven of the top 10. And many of these people have tens or hundreds of millions of views per month with millions of subscribers. And you just mentioned PewDiePie. PewDiePie is an easy example because he's the number one talent on YouTube, uh, which you know, is one of our uh, creators. And it may be interesting to show, we have just one clip to show you, what happened when he showed up in Singapore. And people were not supposed to know he's coming there, 
But take a look at what happens when he showed up. So let's, uh, let's look at that clip. This is PewDiePie showing up in Singapore. I think the clip is going to be coming up in just one second. Yeah, let's do it together. How do I get the rum? Press C oh. when you're standing still. <laughs> It'll make you run. Am I a Viking or a samurai? You're a Viking. Tell me. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you kill me? Say awesome, bros. So, so these stars are not just content creators. They're social influencers, and they have massive following. We've just very recently done um, a short campaign around the Avengers launch, uh, the movie launch. Uh, and we, what we've done, we aggregated uh, our top, some of our creators, 250, and they tweeted uh, in, to their followers. And we generated in one day 96 million uh, social expressions related to, uh, to, 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 uh, to Avengers, the movie. It's incredible. In one day. So, you know, <laughs> the, the impact and influence of, of these creators is, you know, as big and often bigger than major shows on, on, uh, on network television yeah. in America. Pew PewDiePie has about 40 million followers on YouTube. It's around 40 now. Subscribers. Subscribers. Active so people, people who are actually followers. subscribing to his channel on, on YouTube. And what PewDiePie does is he makes videos of him playing video games and comments about them, talks to people you know, via, you know, via social media while he does it, and it's, it's amazing. Talk about the shifting landscape of content. Let's talk about the power of short form content. Why is short form so powerful now? Why is that becoming kind of the norm? So what we've seen over the last few years is, is an emergence of a whole new medium in short form. And what's interesting is, you know, when you say short form, a lot of people make the mistake and say that short form is that long form except shorter, which is not the case. Short form is a whole different medium in the way it's being created, produced, uh, shared, distributed, monetized. It's a whole different category. And this really emerged initially on YouTube. YouTube was a catalyst for this, for this new category. But now with the, uh, with the growth of mobile devices um, and the ubiquity of dist uh, dist uh, distribution mechanism, short form is becoming mainstream. So, you know, this started originally as, you know, self-expression. Possibly today, it's a mainstream uh, part of content, and as mobile devices will continue to grow, and, or the distribution of mobile devices will grow and become more prevalent, the natural place to or natural type of content to consumers on those devices will be short form, and you will continue to continue to see more growth of that category. One of the questions I think a lot of people had, and some of you in this room may have heard about it last year. You heard about the Disney acquisition. How many of you heard about Maker getting bought by Disney? There, a lot of people heard about it for an obscene amount of money. It was uh, like $950 million. It was a tremendous, uh, tremendous sale, tremendous acquisition for Disney. But a lot of people thought when that sale was happening that suddenly Maker was going to become Disney-fied, that suddenly it was going to become like the, like the new Mouseketeer Club or suddenly you guys were going to be making you know, the new iCarly or whatever it would be for, for, the, for these types of channels. What has happened? Explain to us what was attractive about the Disney acquisition for you and kind of what that now means moving forward. Okay, first of all, I take exception to the word obscene amount of money. <laughs> it's a matter of perspective, but I would... Uh, obscene, it would have been a billion. Another 50 million would have made it obscene. But yeah. I would, I would uh, say that it has been a transformational move. First yeah. of all, Disney really is an amazing company. I mean, it's, it's the largest media uh, enterprise in the world. And when you say Disney, you know, in the old days, it used to be Mickey Mouse. Today, it's... Marvel, it's Lucasfilm with Star Wars, it's Pixar, e Pixar Disney Animation, ESPN, Marvel, Avengers, you know, ABC, Parks, Consumer Product. It's a whole world that has been assembled and built over the last few years that is yeah. just amazing. So the opportunity was to take all these amazing franchises and brands uh, that Disney does, where the, in, in all these businesses where Disney does so well and extend that into short form, being a whole new category that is growing. And you know, Disney has always been really at the forefront of, uh, of online 
and the digital um, you know, evolution. And you know, Disney was the first to get on iTunes. Disney was the first to get uh, content unbundled uh, through Dish. And were the first to come onto YouTube um, of the big media players right through the front door. Yeah. What was interesting for Maker is the ability to access and work with these amazing franchises and brands and enable our creators to interface and work with them. Just like the example I gave earlier about Avengers and there are many other examples. So to answer your question, Disney didn't change Maker. If anything, Disney amplified what we do. Yeah. And our creators, many of them are somewhat rogue and you know, independent and like to do their thing, actually got super excited and energized by the opportunity to work with these amazing universes of characters and storylines and expand it into short form. So it's been a year, just about a year now, and it's really nothing but a great experience so far. One of the things that I thought was interesting is it seems, what I, from, the, from the outside perspective, from my, from, my, from my viewpoint, is that once the acquisition happened, I think it made Maker really identify themselves, or really, you, it made you really kind of hone in on what Maker meant, what it meant to be a Maker. I feel like that the identity of Maker really was transformed in a way that became a very solid way to explain, here's who we are, we are individuals creating original content. Was that one of the goals that once the acquisition happened, you had to say, people need to know that we are not, you know, that Disney is, they're, they're, our, they're, our, they're our parent company, but we still have our own identity? You know, we, we, we didn't need to proactively say that. If you look at the acquisitions that Disney made from uh, Lucasfilm or Pixar or Marvel, these entities remain very much, you know, focused on what they do. Yes. It's not that you're independent or autonomous because you're part of an organization but you're very much encouraged to continue to do what you do so well, which is why they bought you in the first place. Uh, but as I said, w what's been really interesting is to see the uh, positive impact that that had on our company. The uh, you know, Maker has a very strong editorial voice and a very strong brand. Even though Maker in itself is not a consumer brand, it is very known uh, in, in, in the community. And, it is in, and, and you know, Disney, in itself is one of the strongest brands in the world, not just yeah. in media. But what's interesting is to see that while the companies are so, you know, different in terms of where they are in the life cycle uh, of, the, of, the, you know, of them as, as, as companies, there's actually a very strong common DNA in focus on creativity, innovation, and consumer experience. And, you know, we always say that for Maker, talent always comes first. We want to work with the best and most successful creators in the world. Yes. And if they want to work with us and they will continue to make great content, everything will fall into place. And Disney is very much the same. Disney ethos is to attract the most creative people in the world that will make, build and create great franchises. So while we are at a different scale today, we share a very common DNA. And clearly, Disney sees the opportunity to expand in this whole new category that today is small, not very small anymore, but you know it's growing and it's going to become a very large part of uh, traditional mainstream media. Talk about the consumption habits of this millennial audience and, and what that means. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you when I had a real power shift in my brain is I was on the subway in New York City and I saw a guy watching Gladiator on his iPhone, and I was like, that's a travesty. That was like, it was like one of the worst things I could have ever met because I would never want to watch Gladiator <laughs> on something so small, you know, where so there's all this action but on a screen this big. But this, there's a shift. There's a culture shift that has completely happened where whether it's this big or whether it's this big, it's ultimately they want to have access. So talk about the consumption habits of this generation and the power that this generation has. Well, the, the, we're talking about the millennial generation. And the millennial generation, which is a bit of a loose term uh, to call, you know, it's kind of between the age of 14 to 34 or 15 to 35. These are people that were 20 by the year 2000. Uh, has more choice than any other generation before. Uh, for content. For content and for ways to consume content. Yes. So this really shifted the way uh, people behave in media. And so I talked earlier about short form being a whole new category that emerged as a result of that. But when you look at the millennial generation, they have much less time, more choice. They want to control what they watch, when they watch it, and how they watch it. And nobody can dictate that. So, you know, the days of, of one editor kind of giving them a line or, or a timeline of what to watch and when to watch are gone. 
And they spend most of their time watching content online and not in the way that we used to watch when we were young. And anyone in the audience with kids will know exactly what I'm talking about, how kids today have much less patience and time to, or propensity to watch advertising in the way we used to. Yeah. So content has to be much more organic, authentic, and be brought to them in the way that they're used to consuming. And so you will see continued growth in consumption of content via online um, devices, online distribution through different devices, primarily mobile. And as there's more content being shifted uh, for consumption into mobile, it will also get shorter. And it's really interesting to note that if you take the top 100 video sites in America, according to Comscore, that doesn't actually count mobile. Comscore only counts desktop. If you take the top 100 video sites in America, including YouTube, Facebook, AOL, all Amazon, all the way to uh, Hulu and Netflix and ABC.com and ESPN.com and all of the top video sites, the average length of a video went down from 2013 from five minutes to less than four minutes in 2014. So in a year, it went down by almost 20, by more than 20%, almost 25%. So content is getting shorter, uh, even on desktop. And on mobile, it will even be a stronger trend. And you will continue to see that as time goes on. And it's not that people will consume more television as they grow older, but they will consume more online content as they grow younger. So basically, in, in, in 2020, all the shows will actually be the length of a commercial. <laughs> well, it's important to say, you know, people kind of always bring up the, you know, how this TV will be affected and the, and the current players. Yeah. We, we believe that the incumbent players, the, the big media companies, actually have a very, you know, built-in, very strong built-in advantage because they own major brands, they have distribution outlets, they have a relationship with the consumer, and they have huge infrastructures. It's only about whether they embrace it. So take Disney as an example. You know, ownership of major global television distribution outlets from broadcast to cable. Uh, and when Disney sees the trend, they're not burying their head in the sand. They say, well, let's embrace it and, and add that to our offering. And, and many of the things that we do today are in very strong collaboration and partnership with, with Disney television, you know, the, the various distribution outlets because yeah. it's very symbiotic and it's been very, working very well. The, uh, the one important thing as we come, come to the end of this, is, which is important and I'm sure everybody here wants to know, is money. Because everybody always says, how do you make money online? How do you make money from content? So how does Maker monetize content and what is the future of monetization when it comes to content? Because this is the thing I think any content creator really wants to know. Well, uh, you know, it, Starting with YouTube, th there's been press coverage all over talking about YouTube already making billions of, uh, of dollars at different publications. I don't want to put any number, but it's now measured in billions on YouTube alone. And historically, it used to be about monetizing AdSense or the advertising product on YouTube. And now it's much broader than that because when you define short form as a category, in addition to advertising, there's also branded entertainment, and, and the sponsorship, as well as new distribution outlets uh, beyond YouTube. And so it's, it's a real business. And if you look at what happened in the early days of social media or uh, blogging or you know, different types of media, many of these companies didn't make a dime for many years. Yeah. So we may be ahead of our time by making money and <laughs> you know, not bad at it, but it's really about growing scale. And when you see where the audience is heading and how consumption habits are shifting, you know that there will be money following. And when you talk about online advertising, you know, as an advertiser, you look for three things. Targeted reach, engagement, and accurate measurement. All of which are actually very, very effective online. What used to be missing in online is reach, you know, a large reach. But this is changing as online distribution is growing. Yeah. So you will see more dollar shift uh, to online distribution, online content, and we're just at the beginning, a long way to go, but it's heading into a very interesting and exciting place. Let's have a nice round of applause for Anand Kreitz, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, my All friend. Right. Thanks.